I believe that we are moving towards bipolar world. I do not believe that it is feasible for China to completely overtake America. But if you want to use monetary history, right, gold has actually outlasted every stock market, every government for the last 5,000 years. Welcome everybody to episode 20 of the Backholder Pod. So today we have a great guest with us and don't be don't be fooled by his very kind demeanor. He actually does a lot of very um, interesting content on YouTube and we have Sean Fu on the pod today. So Sean, how have you been doing recently? Hey guys, uh, not too bad. I think right now the markets are very, very unstable to say the least, right? You know, it keeps going up, then it goes down. Then, you know, you, you get a bit of FOMO, then you get a bit of fear of getting in as well, uh at least when it comes to the macro perspective, right? Mm. I think things are getting from bad to worse. Uh, and this is what my channel actually tries to cover. So we try to uh, mix in uh, the macro perspective of uh, how the economy is actually doing and how it can actually affect uh, our investment decisions. And more importantly, I think it's about like portfolio allocation, right? Like, should I be more in equities during this period? Because I think we all more or less have the consensus that over the long-term time frame, right? Equities is the way to be, is the way to go up. But should we allocate some of our money to alternative assets? Maybe, uh, you know, bonds, maybe gold, maybe put more into real estate. So these are the kind of questions that uh, more or less keeps me up at night. Lah. So I think also just a very quick introduction for audience that don't really follow Sean. So I believe that Sean, your audience is like very, very international, right? It's not really focused in the Singapore base. Yeah, that's the interesting thing, right? So my audience, I took a look at the stats like last week. It's around 25% American, 12% Singaporean, 10% Malaysian, uh, then around 30% from the Eurozone. Okay. Then the rest is from the, the rest of the world, uh, got Africa, right. got it's all a mis mismatch of everything. Uh. Right. So Sean actually runs a huge YouTube channel. He has, I think it was over 70,000 subs now. And for those of you who haven't subscribed to him, do head over to his channel. But I think maybe just to rewind back, right, to really understand your current own YouTube journey, right? Maybe you can share with us, like, how did it start? Why did you have that intention of starting? And how, how's, how's your experience now thus far? Yeah, sure. So it all started from my uh, day job. I mean, I mean my business. Lah. So my business is mainly a content marketing agency. So we're actually doing things like helping uh, companies rank articles on Google to get all the clicks, you know, rank them nicely for SEO. Then I was always wondering about um, when it comes to the YouTube game, right? Because previously I was from the finance space. Then I went on YouTube and I found out there's a lot of influencers out there, especially from America, right? And I'm, I'm sure you all heard of the Graham Stephen, Andre Jake, and, you know, Grant Cardone, all, all these kind of people, right? So I'm wondering, is it possible to replicate it in Singapore? Because I was thinking, how, maybe it's possible for me to build an audience, spread my message out to the people out there. So I went online and tried to look for role models in Singapore to actually emulate. Then I found uh, Kelvin Learns Investing. Then I looked through some of his videos, right? And I said, hey, these videos are very informative. I think I can do something like that. So I kind of started out in a smaller niche, which is the gold and silver niche, talking about how to invest in gold, silver, the kind of coins, the kind of mindset you need then. From there, I slowly branched out more towards the macro perspective. I wanted to spread one message here also. For those of you who are watching until now, don't remember, don't forget to smash the like button on your on your way out. I think that's a very important metric that all YouTubers want to have. But yeah, I think um for Bunti, do you have any questions for Sean before we actually I, I check on uh, Sean's YouTube video before. Uh I, I noticed that I think that the main theme is really like gold and silver investing, and then not so like like as you said, like macro is also there, but not so much on like more mainstream investment, for example, like stocks and so on. So my question to you is that is that your own personal allocation is like what 80 90 percent in gold or is it like you 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 just invest a, a small amount in gold but then you actually just for the content purpose you you try to bring up more attention to to this uh, alternative asset class okay it's more about uh attention to the alternative asset class right okay so i think i wrote down my allocation here on the sheet just in case okay so i need to say that's the pre-2020-2021 world right what was my allocation back then and what's my allocation now? So in the past, right, I was 80% equities, 20% gold. So I still believe in the idea that equities is still the way to grow your wealth over time. I mean, let's let's put real estate out of the situation la, for, for normal people, la, normal people, 80% equities, then 20% gold. But now that we have transitioned to, how do I say, a very chaotic world, right? A world that interest rates are still going up. Like my own prediction for the Fed funds is at least 5%, at least 5%, maybe 6%, right? We are still going up gradually. And because of that, right, I've lowered my uh, weighting to equities. <clears throat> I've increased my weighting to gold. 
and more towards money market funds. Uh. So in a sense, you know, you're putting your money in a place that gives you four, uh, 3 to 4.5% to just wait it out. So I think it's around 30% gold, 30% equities, uh, 10% commodities, and 30% mar- money market funds. Uh. And, and it always fluctuates uh, from here to there. Uh. Do, do you know that gold, right, doesn't do well when the real yield is high? Meaning that when the interest rate is high, right, usually gold doesn't do well. Right? But but why why you decide to put into gold at, at this point, given that re, uh, real interest rate has went up so much? Right. Okay. So the idea of real interest rates, uh, that is just uh, one factor of gold, right? It's, it's, it's obvious that let's say you're getting a real yield from your bonds. Chances are a lot of people will allocate the money all the way to bonds uh, because you're actually getting a real yield. But then there are many other factors when it comes to gold, right? So gold is, ideally, we should kind of see it as an insurance hedge, a hedge against really bad chaos going uh, out in the market, the money printing, uh, the geopolitical risks out there. And especially one thing that I believe many people have not really touched on it is getting some money out of the financial system as well. Uh, in the past, I had like 80% in the financial system, right? As long as you have bonds, you have uh, money market accounts, everything is all in the system where there's some risk in it. And I'm not saying that the market is suddenly going to collapse tomorrow. You know? There's a lot of uh, measures like the SDIC. And if I'm not wrong, a lot of brokerages, they protect up to like a quarter million or is it half a million dollars worth. So that one is there. But right now we can see a lot of instability in the world, right? And slowly people are slowing, to, uh, trying to flock back into gold. So what I'm allocating into gold is both a place to uh, store physical wealth, maybe for generational. So I have some uh, physical gold bars and coins as well. But I also have a paper position. And that is when I believe that a lot of people are crowding the gold trade, you know, like GLD ETFs, uh, PHYF ETFs. Then that's where I will exit. Lah. So for me, it's both a kind of a savings vehicle as well as a bit of a speculation play when everyone has the doomsday fever in them, like the gold fever. I, I do think that there is a very convincing <coughs> argument about this whole gold idea and the, the chaos of the world, right? So actually, I have to throw the question to Kelvin yeah. like, before you ask this question. So Kelvin, have you been positioning your own portfolio or do you even have interest in in entering into a gold trade or gold position? Yeah, so a while I did uh, a, a video on gold. La. My conclusion was that gold is a good hedge. It's a good hedge against whatever stuff, la. But the thing is, it doesn't produce any value. So it's like, if you look at the long term, there's, when you factor in inflation, right, there's like 0% return from anything. So it basically, it's a hedge against any downturn. La. I, just, I just went to check the price of gold. La. Since 2019, no, no, 2021, SPY has went down like almost 15%. Or gold has given about negative 2% return. So it, it barely lo- lost any value. La. If you look at the long term, it's definitely SPY that's giving a higher return. So my question for Sean is like, when are you planning to go back into uh, like 80% equities instead? What, what, si- what kind of signs are you looking for? Okay, so for me, I would say mainly is stabilization of the interest rate first, right? Because if we look at uh, a lot of wealth is actually being drained away from both the consumer and the uh, governments of the world, institutions, right? Especially when the interest rates go up, a lot of oxygen is being sucked out of the, sucked out of the room. Lah. In other words, so a lot of people, they have less uh, spending power. I mean, I can come to see that earnings report uh, over time, they're not really hitting the expectations. Uh, and we are kind of seeing quite a bit of layoffs happening. One of my concerns is how a lot of the institutions out there uh, especially in America, they're starting to redefine a lot of terms, which is quite re- worrying to me. La. You know, they're trying to come up with all kinds of weird metrics like super core inflation, stripping out food, energy, and shelter. So it kind of makes a lot of the numbers fuzzy, but we still need to latch on to something. Ma. So we have to latch on to the CPI inflation number. Ah. So at least for me, right, once I see inflation come down maybe four months, five months, six months in a row, they hold the interest rate steady, right? That means chances are they'll just pause before a pivot. And this is when I'm going to allocate more into equities. Like right now, right? Let's say I have $100. I only allocate around $30 or $40 into equities. I still keep buying. I'm still a dollar cost averager, but not as aggressive as before. Because in my situation, I got a bit lucky exiting the markets before the crash because I was buying a house. I was buying a house. So I needed to consolidate all my money because the house I bought itself Forum HDB and you know lah, the prices now are quite bonkers. Uh. So I needed to slowly take out my money and make sure that 
there's less risk for me when it comes to consolidating my cash. So I escaped the majority of the carnage out there. So right now, if I look at my portfolio, I'm still technically down 3 to 5%, uh, but not as bad as the carnage that just happened over the past. Uh. So I would say it's mainly about interest rates. Uh. Eric, do you have a question? Yeah, because uh, I was I too look at the price chart, but yeah. I look at the gold chart from 1915. It's like 108 years ago. So I realized that like gold prices, right, actually uh, was about 500 plus in 1915. And then they, they had a peak somewhere in, uh, where was it? This peak was in, oh, around the year I was born, 1979. Oh. <laughs> so there was peak about, two, about I think about $2,600, uh, $2,500. And then after it dropped all the way down in the 2000s to about... Uh, 450 and then it spiked up again so if you can see the chart right it's now yeah. it's like a forming a, a kind of a top you know it's quite toppish we are at about 2000 plus right uh, close to right. 2000 or is it 2000 1900 yeah so we are quite close to the peak about 2005 i i would say that for gold right if you look at the 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 whole 100 year history it right. looks like we are pretty near to the the top side of 2500 as opposed to the downside, which is about, I think, 200 over dollars. So, uh, I don't know. Technical-wise, it looks like there's more <laughs> risk than reward. So, why would you put so much allocation? I would say 30% is quite right. a bit into Be gold. Before Sean answer, right, I just want to ask, uh, technical analysis <laughs> can do so long period, 100 plus years. Uh? <laughs> Um, I can do any period you want. Technical analysis is basically just drawings. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, technical analysis, there are two camps, right? One of it says that uh, it's very, very accurate. Then the other camp, it says it's as good as astrology. Ma. So the answer is yeah. possibly somewhere in between. Uh. Mm -hmm. To answer Eric's question, right? I think we need to uh, divorce the idea that gold is equitable to equities, uh, right? So equities, we know, unless a country or economy really Fs up, right? it should continue to go up, right? Maybe it outperforms the uh, growth of the GDP or maybe it underperforms, but over time it should go up. But gold basically is a representation of a true store of wealth, money itself. It's not supposed to, in a sense, outperform a leading stock market like the S&P. But if you look at gold compared to other indices, like uh, for example, China, right? It has actually exceeded uh, the performance of, for example, the MCHI over time. But of course, it lags behind the S&P 500 now. So I guess when people actually invest or they buy into gold, right, it's not really to try to per se outperform the S&P because that one is, uh, is a losing battle. La. As long as America is the leading economy, right, a lot of money will keep flooding in there and then the economy starts to grow. So it will always, not say always, it will at many points in time and over the long course of history, you will outperform gold. But then I still think that having some gold in your own portfolio is, is a good thing to do because you want to have the asset that's uncorrelated out of the banking system as well as from the financial markets. Uh. So for example, if we look at the past one year, I think we can say 12 months to 16 months, right? I think we have seen that the SPY has dropped from 4,800 all the way down to a low of Correct me if I'm wrong, 3,700 or 3,800, right? So I think that's equitable to a 18 to 22% drop. But if you look at the same time period, right? Gold has actually stayed flat or maybe has gone up 1% or 2%, which is a win in a sense when everything else is falling, right? As long as you keep pace, right? That asset so-called is winning. So, I mean, if you're a kind of micromanager, when it comes to your investing, you could always liquidate your gold since you believe that... Um, stocks are going to go up and since gold is actually performing you can liquidate it and take the proceeds and just pump it back into stocks uh. so it's always good to have some asset that's uh, uncorrelated and you can actually uh, rebalance your portfolio as the markets move up because we won't know how things will go on for the next 5 to 10 to 20 years right like in my own opinion I still believe the SPY will continue growing over time but are we still going to see the good old days of 8 to 12 to 13% a year of the S&P? You know, the kind of returns, that kind of, you close your eyes, you take a, you take a dart, you anyhow throw, or you confirm make money, that kind of situation, which I have a bit of my doubts, lah, whether we'll see such fantastic performance going forward. Just a follow-up question. Uh, sorry, taking, yeah. taking a bit of time. So just a follow-up question, right? Like uh, you mentioned that you have some in your money market. 
and yeah. then you have the go one. What's the percentage uh, allocation for money market, may I ask? Okay. So right now, uh, I'm around 30% gold, 30 to 40% money markets. Uh. Money market. Market market. So it's split more towards the Singapore dollar. Yeah. And uh, US dollar. Because US dollar, you need it. You need to buy all your stocks, everything. So mm -hmm. it's best mm -hmm. to just hold some. Um, the One of the best Valentine's Day gift is to get free money. So which introducing today's sponsor, which is Momo. So Momo platform currently is running a promotional campaign until the end of Feb of 2023. So if you deposit uh, more than $2,700 into Momo, you can spin a wheel and get up to one free Apple share, which, which is worth uh, around 200 plus Singapore dollars. And more importantly, they have a few of the side quests and um, a few of the uh, events that they're running on the site where you deposit more than $100 into Moomoo Cash Plus, you can get a $2 cash back every day for 10 days. And uh, one last point, there's also this Fishing Joy game where you can play a game and win up to $88 cash. So if you're interested, um, the link is in the description box down below. So um, feel free to head down and just use our link uh, below. And yeah, thank you Moomoo for sponsoring this video. Oh, I, I just want to give some pushback on, on the part that you say uh, you are expecting S&P 500 higher return than gold, but you still want to uh, invest in gold. The reason is because the difference right, is actually quite big. You know, It's, it's not right. like, okay, slightly higher. It's not like that. Uh, I'll, I'll give some, some arguments, uh, which is a book that I, I read. Okay, you know, okay. we have audience that say we all follow books, and so I have to pick something up. No, from... we, are, we are nerds. <laughs> not we follow we are nerds. books. We only yeah. read books. That's yeah. what we say. We only yeah. read books. So uh, actually, uh, maybe later we'll put that uh, graphic in, in, the, in the video. Just want to show that from, for 200 years, right? Actually, right. when you invest $1 in gold, uh, that $1 grows to $4, okay? But okay. that $1 put in equities, right? It went to 2.3 million. So the, okay. the difference is very, very big. And uh, I'll quote this, uh, I mean, this quote from uh, Warren Buffett. He, he said that why he doesn't invest in gold is because gold is just like sit there shiny object doing nothing it's not productive and unlike you know companies that we invest in could be any companies like apple tesla they are they, they have factories running churn out stuff adding value to the society right but go is just like sitting there you know like acting shiny pretty right. it's useless right so so just want to give a bit of pushback and want to hear your your response on this so basically i and put this on the other camera right? I, I wanted to i wouldn't say i'm defending go but i wanted to just add in my own thoughts because this was something that just came out in my mind, right? I think all of us are very, very confident with huge amount of history backing us. Oh, you go back 19, 15, 200, 300 years of history, right? But all these are backward looking. 110. It's backward looking, by the way. So all your, all your, all your arguments are pre premised on the idea that the, the great American rise up of the no. 100 years of... I, I don't American think it's history. all, you know. That's why if I just purely look at historical, then you are right. I'm purely looking at historical. I don't even know like stocks is going to give me 7% for the next 10 years, 20 years. That's why I, I bring out the part that is whether it's productive or not because something that isn't productive, just sit there doing nothing, right? How can you expect the asset class to grow at what, 7 8%, you know? So, so those who invest in, in stocks, they are rewarded because of the risk-taking, because of the, they are adding value to the society. So I want to bring that point in to, to say that this is not just looking at historical. Okay, sure. I understand this argument, right? So comes back to the fundamental question that we discussed earlier. Like we are trying to conflate a productive asset, which is, uh, you know, the SPY or the companies of the world compared with gold, which is supposed to be a primary store of value. So the thing is what she can put uh, postulated just now, right? It's like we are right now looking back towards history, right? We are seeing the rise of America and we are seeing um, the stock market continually go up because of a lot of money is pouring there, a lot of innovation is happening, a lot of companies are actually making money, correct? So, however, when you look at gold, right, people are so called rewarded by holding gold is because they distrust that our fiat currency is actually getting stronger, they distrust that it is a store of value. And every time when you have irresponsible government actions, right? For example, the Federal Reserve, they start printing a lot of money. For example, back in 08, I think it was 800 to a trillion dollars, 800 billion to a trillion dollars was printed to save the American economy. Then you look on at the great bailouts of 2020, I would call it, right? You know, they started to print out uh, four to five trillion, expanded the balance sheet, and then they started injecting thousands of dollars into Americans' wallets, uh. So the thing about gold is that it is so-called an inactive metal, that's correct. But yes, thousands of years of history have actually 
storing value. It accounts for all these kind of monetary debasements out there. And yeah, that's true that the SPY, right? They have actually performed fantastically for the last 50, 100 years. But if you want to use monetary history, right? Gold has actually outlasted every stock market, every government for the last 5,000 years. And even in today's context, right? It is still here. That's the thing. So I believe that you can throw all your money to the SPY or to the stock market, but you need to be aware of you're taking a bit of a risk in a sense. Uh, and if you outperform, you should get risk taking. Like if you put all your money in the stock market, right? Uh, you are predicating that one, America will still be the global power. Chances are it will still be a global power for decades to come. But you're also predicating that, you know, interest rates uh, will come down to a satisfactory level so that, uh, you know, all the economy will go up and inflation will come down back to a satisfactory level so that people, not only have money spent on food, rent, you know, they can take money to invest and speculate. Lah. So that is a lot of what ifs. And I still believe that that what if story. That's why the majority of my money was in equities, right? I still believe in that. But I believe that I need to have a, a black swan investment, so as to say, right? Just in case of external risk, something goes wrong. Uh, let's say geopolitically, China comes up and let's say they push gold as a form of medium of exchange, for example. Then a the price of gold will skyrocket to a certain point. Uh, and that is a kind of, um, educated bet that I would like to make. Uh, I just want to add on some comment. I think Eric, for Eric and Bunti, the argument is more like long term. Uh, why why do you invest in gold long term? But I think for Sean, he is actually uh hedging just for the short term because pre twenty twenty he's just like twenty percent gold only. It's only recently they increase his allocation. So I think this is more like a bit of uh timing the market in the short term while waiting for the interest rate and all this to go back to the normal levels. Uh, then I, I think my next my, my question would be like, if, if people are distrusting in the fiat, if people want to hedge against the government printing money, why why go and not like crypto? <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> like, like, bi- like Bitcoin. Bitcoin. I think yeah. Bitcoin okay. specifically. Let's move the crypto thing yeah, because, because, first. Like, yeah, Bitcoin. because like for go is everything is physical. Like uh in, in times of war, like World War Three, are you going to carry your go bar all around the world? Or are you going to use the internet to transfer money around? Okay, so for this one, there's a lot of what is like right? and we try to cover some of the uh the ideas out there, right? Because this is very, very interesting. This was the Bitcoin versus go argument, right? So so when it comes to Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, right? Uh I think we can discount the idea of the you know the big 10,000% rise right because that one's over already lah. so that rise is like the discovery of fire ma. you discover fire then you will make a lot of money everyone what along the way lah. I'm also quite pissed off I didn't sell everything that I own and put into bitcoin right or else I'll be on a mansion in Switzerland already lah. I won't be here eh. but then I think going forward we need to understand that is bitcoin more of a store of value or is it more effective as like a cross-border medium of exchange? Uh, that's the thing. So let's say when you're talking about store of value, right? Uh, my difficulty when it comes to Bitcoin is that firstly, it doesn't have the monetary history, for example, as gold over the, the you know the hundreds of thousands of years. That's one thing that is technically against it. Then another point that I would like to make is the rise of government digital currencies, uh, which is CBDCs. Uh. So this is something that really worries me like, over time, will there be a lot of um, pushback from the government authorities, especially when they are trying to push their own agenda out there? You know, you, cons- uh, you transact in our CBDCs, in our government digital currency, the digital US dollar, for example. Or will they allow a kind of store of value or asset that can be easily transacted across the world to still exist? So this is a bit of a, a idea, a worry that keeps me up at night. Lah. Because if we look just at China, right? If I'm not wrong, over the last few years or even longer than that, they actually clamped down on crypto. They don't want people to actually uh, invest in crypto. Then, you know, they give a lot of uns- uh, answer like, oh, speculating. Uh, we are worried of this, worried of that. But in my opinion, right, the true answer is that I think they are afraid of capital flows getting out of China much more easily, right? Because I think you only can escape with 50,000 US dollars a year or something like that. But crypto, the amount is unlimited per se. Yeah. So my first pushback is, will the governments allow this to exist 
in the long term. Yeah. Then the second uh, idea is that I think crypto, especially with Bitcoin, it does have a kind of position in, in the world, right? And as you said, chances are, wet say, uh, we get into a war, right? That we all need to sell. We need to bring our barang barang. We need to uh, escape. Definitely, you can't bring your equities with you, right? Your home, your property, real estate, private property also has to be there. You have to say goodbye to it. Uh, you can bring gold, but after a certain amount, you'll get bulky, right? That's one thing. You cannot bring them. What, you're going to go to the border, then bribe all the security guards and gold coins, right? That one's a bit uh, unrealistic, right? So crypto, I would say that's the number one utility. I would say that's the undisputed utility no one in the world can actually fight against. But my worry is still the government's coming after it, the regulations and all the, all the stupid Celsius or the FTX scandal. It's not helping Bitcoin. But Sean, do you even have a slight position? Like, like you said, right? Because we are always talking about now. Now the focus is on hedging, right? So what if crypto, that 10,000 you miss, why it comes out a 100,000% move? in the next coming decade or something. Yeah, do, do you even have a small, small allocation to crypto? I used to have, but I, didn't have, I don't have any more. So right now, this is a question that I keep asking myself. You know, every time I go to the shower, should I have more Bitcoin? Should I allocate a bit more? Then constantly reading up. Because to be told, right, I'm not a very uh, strong crypto expert. Now. So I cannot come up with all the sophisticated views. I know that there's use cases from Ethereum to Bitcoin, but there's a lot of incentives, I, I believe, for the powers that be to actually clamp it down and at the very least, let it be just a nice alternative store of value. La. But as a true medium of exchange, right, I do not know whether it's, it's going to happen. Because if you look at the CBDCs, right, in the future, they can program two things into digital money, right? Like they can, and it's been tested out in China already. If I'm not wrong, they gave the Chinese people 300 or was it just $30 US dollars worth of yuan to try, right? Digital yuan. And they program it in such a way that you can you only can spend it in certain retailers in Shenzhen or something like that, right? You can't just take it and go to McDonald's or whatever, right? You only can buy it maybe from their local stores. And th- that's the worry about CBDCs. Is it possible for them to program a kind of code that prevents you from transacting with any of the exchange, crypto exchanges, right? To protect you. And then there's another worry that what if they program a lot of funny things like, you know, low interest rates or negative interest rates into the crypto itself, or sorry, into the CBDC itself. Uh. So that is a lot of hidden theories that uh, keeps me from allocating much into crypto. La. Actually, I do think they can, but maybe not so in the Western countries. Maybe in China, they'll be one of the biggest proponents of creating like money that expires, creating or giving you salary, a percentage of the salary of, of in, in some funny quotes and, and how you they, they force you to spend and force you to inflate the, the, the dollars away. But yeah, Bunti. Yeah, just, uh, just now, I think Kevin brought up the comparison of uh, digital gold or Bitcoin versus gold, right? Actually, I want to bring another comparison because just like you also mentioned that uh, you plan to buy house and so on, right? So I think for Singapore or, or I think for most Asian uh, countries, when talk about asset allocations, I think m- many people have most of their assets put into their own houses. So real estate. So real estate itself, right? If you think about it, it's also kind of like alternative asset class because it is like real, like physical. We stay in it and so on. So they, they share some similar characteristic as gold because both are like physical, right? Whereas for stocks and bonds, these are like paper, paper monies, uh, more prone to inflation, hyperinflation and so on, right? So if I look at it from asset allocation perspective, uh, let's say if I already own my house, doesn't if I really paint like total my total yep. wealth, right? It's like wow, huge portion is already at, at the houses. So should I actually put more money into the stocks to balance out? And do I really need gold in there? You know, that that's my question. Sir. So so I want to hear your your opinions when comparing properties versus gold. Sure. So this one it really depends on uh your your worldview, right? Your narrative of what you believe things are going to evolve, right? So. Let's talk about property from the Singaporean context. Because in, in America, the property prices could crash, right? But Singapore could still remain stable because we are in a very unique, unique world, right? Very, different, very different. World. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the thing about property in Singapore, right, is I would say it's one of the best investments that's continued to prove over a long period of time. You can get uh, rich or rich from it, or at least you'll definitely scale with inflation. 
And then you can see all the rentals coming up, which is mind boggling, right? 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. And then the landlords are like the gods of the world right now. If you don't like it, you can, you can leave and I can find another can tenant. Yeah, I can leave, find another tenant within the next 10 days. That kind of, that kind of mentality. La. Because when it comes to Singapore, right? So far, right? I think the government has been doing a very good job in maintaining the economy. You know, they're getting uh, the foreigners to come in. This is actually boosting a lot of demand for real estate. Then you can see a lot of people, they are struggling to find uh, a good place to rent at a reasonable price. So buying a house, buying a property in Singapore, I think is one of the most important priority for anyone, right? At least you will hedge with inflation at the very least. So let's say you already have your house, right? Then it makes sense to invest into stock, stock markets, sorry, the SPY for example, right? But what is your future plan? So for example, let's say my next plan is to get a rental property for in the next uh, three, five or 10 years, right? I would still allocate some of my money baseline for gold because the value of gold, right? Yeah, it is a bit volatile over time, but it has shown to actually keep its value. It doesn't go up, doesn't go down in a sense. So you want to maintain some purchasing power at even kill value so that you know when it comes point uh, to really exchange your gold for another house in a sense, you know, to pay the down payment or to uh, pay up the rest of your previous mortgage so you can get a new loan or something like that, right? Um, that is when I think gold actually shines because you do not know how the stock market will really move in the next 10 to 20 years, right? It can definitely uh, climb 7 to 10% and another nice bull rally, right? But what if something happens two years before you want to buy a house? A great financial crisis come down, right? Boom, then you're down 20 to 30%, right? Then in a sense, you're trapped. However, however with gold, right? It can do some form of planning in a sense, uh, so even in a sense of uh, maintaining some money for a big purchase in the future, right? I would even say at this point, at this juncture of time, right? Bonds are actually superior than uh, stocks because right now everything is shaky. And let's say you put your money into um, bonds, money, market funds, or whether it's fixed D, it doesn't matter, right? The rates are around 35 to 5% la, depending on which bank or which entity you go to, right? So right now you're comparing between... Uh, guaranteed upside which is still losing against inflation right? that's true lah. a guaranteed upside of four to five percent versus a probability which is getting scarier by the day of the market falling anywhere from five to thirty percent so this is the kind of uh measurements that we all have to make lah. that's why everyone's different lah. yeah why, why is it so scary uh? like what you're talking about five to thirty percent anything going to collapse soon yeah, no, what, what are the scenarios uh, that take it that way? Okay, so uh, let's leave aside all the doomsday prediction, right? There's a lot of doomsday people say you're 4 by 90%, 50%. Okay, my, my belief right now, right? Like what I'm thinking is going to happen, right? Is the S&P is going to fall back to its lows of 3,600, 3,700, right? Uh, over time. And I believe the recession will be short and shallow. That means I don't believe it's going to last for three to four to five years, right? Because I believe at the end of the day, right, the Federal Reserve, the governments out there, right, they'll start to drop interest rates once they get an uh, indication that inflation is under control. And then, you know, maybe Biden is twisting his arm, a hey, save the economy, that kind of thing, they don't make me look bad, that kind of stuff. So th that's why I'm still into equities right now. I'm still dollar cost averaging because I cannot discount the fact that the market could have a very sharp rebound and I'll miss it. But I also believe that I need to allocate some of my money outside of stocks, whether it's gold, whether it's bonds, right? Because there's a lot of scenarios that could, that could make the market crash even further. Like 2007, a lot of the people believe that the market was still strong, right? I think even before the recession, uh, the Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke said, oh, like there's nothing wrong with it, both IT. The real estate market is strong. The state of the union is strong. Then after that, everything crashed to hell. So there's so many uncertainties, right? I roll my dice more where I can find a bit of a guaranteed upside while uh, hedging against the downside. Lah. I think this whole discussion like back and forth between Bunti and Sean, right? It's really just purely on the com how comfortable you are in terms of your asset allocation. And Bunti actually keep focusing on, oh, the 8, 10, 20, oh, long term, never mind. Don't worry. I throw everything to SPO. Don't worry. Just carry on. Like your, your, your entire idea is 
premised on, on that. While Sean, on the other hand, I think he's, he's more cautious in terms of his asset allocation and how he wants to deploy my money. At least that's a, a bystander viewpoint on, on how, it, how, how I see. Kelvin, do you have a separate topic or do you have an additional comment on this? So uh, I think uh, we we are keep we keep talking about the market crash um market crash market crash but if you want to look at probability <clears throat> isn't it better to bet on the growth of a company and and not the market crash market crash <laughs> like for example for example uh a Tesla uh it still has a long runway uh it's still growing it's at the what at the start of the S curve whatever lah. so isn't yeah. it better to bet on a company growing rather than uh the market crash or or, or go probability to go up instead and, and just bet over the long term lah. sorry Sean I want to ask do you stock pick or do you just buy into broad based indexes in your general portfolio around 70% is ETFs but then 30% I do stock pick a bit lah. so like one of my uh holdings is GSK the ph- pharmaceutical uh stock and I believe that going forward like what Kelvin said right if you really want to make good returns right you can't just dump everything to an ETF anymore you have to do some stock picking right so uh, I'm not so sure about Tesla I don't have any positions in Tesla so you know if you want me to comment on Tesla it's like speaking to a monkey la. I cannot, oh, I cannot it, it doesn't have to be proper... like Tesla la. it can be like what GSK um, yeah. or even Alibaba just, just any stock that uh, yeah. that you think has a long term growth wrong. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be better to bet on that instead yeah, I would say that it's always better to accumulate positions in that that you're very um you're very confident in, right? Keep accumulating positions over time that stock sh- uh, should outperform um the rest of the market if you're correct about it. Lah. But then in the sense that I don't feel very comfortable allocating all my money into a single stock as well. That's why I also put into ETFs, right? So I hold quite a bit of ETFs. I hold um the SPY, you know, through VOO, I hold the MCHI, the one that tracks China as well. Then I hold individual stocks, uh, GSK, etc. Some Apple stocks as well. So these are some of the companies that I do hold. But I, I mean, for my channel, it looks like I'm only talking 100% about Go, right? Because it's it's more of my interest, even though it's a much smaller per- a percentage of my allocation than other people think la, from the from the surface level. But I want to talk about this interest, right? So um, it's quite it's quite interesting because I don't think a lot of people have interest in specifically like macro politics, this kind of thing. Because um, it feels like uh, it, it's a very hard topic to understand. Every time I talk about politics, especially people my age group, um, I don't I don't know how old Sean is, but if I can speculate, you're probably in your thirties. The I think. 35, 36. Yeah, there. 35, 36. So, so, so in, in that instance, right, not a lot of people like, to, oh, politics, or, let's not talk about it, or it's a very sensitive topic. So I want to understand like the history or the context on why or how, what got you started to interested to knowing the intricacies of how the world moves and, and all these geopolitical tensions and stuff like that. Right. So when it comes to geopolitics and when it comes to economy, right, I think it's best that we can define the argument or, or set our world in just two views, right? One of it is where is the money going to flow, right? So once you condense everything down to this idea, where is the money going to flow and how trusted is the financial system? Lah? So for example, let's talk about how the money is going to flow. So for over the last few decades, I think uh, it's uh, 100% consensus that all the money has been flowing to America over time, right? Over the last 20, 30, 50 years, because uh, the currency was very strong. America did a lot of things correctly on the on its way up, right? You know, in the past, they linked it to gold. Then after that, uh, they did the petrol dollar so that, you know, all the, all the oil sales were priced in dollars. So there's a natural kind of uh, system that all the dollars, once you hold dollars, what do you do? you funnel it back to U.S. treasuries or then you funnel it back to uh, U.S. equities at, at the same time. Right? So when all the money rush to treasuries, you can see that the bond yields actually start to go down and that actually helps America grow faster. So everything is connected in a sense. But once you see all the chaos going right now, right, you see of a lot of instability of where is the money going to flow into the future. So for example, let's just take uh, the China... Mm, US tensions right now, right? So right now we see America making a lot of uh, questionable decisions. Uh. You know, you can say it's right, it's wrong, but one of it is obviously uh, the sanctions on Russian assets. Uh, for example, that's one thing. Like if you confiscate all your a country's wealth, right? Even though you believe the reason is correct, 
other countries might not believe it's correct, uh, especially when it comes to countries that are quite opposite of America as when it comes to China. So you have to think from the Chinese perspective, am I going to continually put all my money back into uh, US debt claims, right? Am I going to subsidize them to punish me? Because if you look at some of the situations out there, you know, China, they have been, uh, sorry, China, yeah, they have been subject to a lot of sanctions from America, especially from the technology front, right? You know, they're banning uh, the chips. They are not allowing skilled American uh, chip makers to actually work in the companies there. So you think from China, right? If I'm giving them low interest rates, right? For them to accelerate their industries in order for them to hurt me, does it really make sense? So you think about it, where else should I put my money into, right? So chances are China, you know, they have been uh, continually buying gold for the last uh, few months officially, but we all believe that, at least in the gold community, we all believe that they're actually buying much more in secret. They're buying up their own supply using their own money. Where they are going, where are they going after? They're going to invest in, uh, you know, the Belt Road Initiative. They're putting their money to Africa. They're putting their money to Saudi Arabia. They are putting their money to other uh, areas. Uh. And because of that, right, we have to we, we appreciate the fact that when the money actually leaves America, a lot of the money is not going back into the bonds, right? The American economy might not accelerate as fast as before. It might not accelerate at 7, 8, 9, or 10%, right? And let's say China does everything well, right? Everything well, right? You know, their, lock, their lockdowns actually are, are reversed well. They reopen then obviously some of the money will go into China and boost their stock market that way. Uh. So projecting into the future, right, it's going to be hard to really predict 100%. But then my own opinion is that some of the money leaving America will go into China, will go into gold and other emerging markets. Uh. So you said, you, you talk about the, the, the two things, right? So the, yep. the one thing is about the money flowing. What's the Correct. second point? Second thing is the trust of money. The trust okay. of money is like right now we can see that there's a lot of uh, deficit spending going on, right? There's uh, America that's constant, constant, consistently challenging their own debt ceiling as well. So a lot of people say, oh, America, they are going to continually raise the debt ceiling, which is true, right? Until they can't. Because right now we see the amount of debt payments to their revenues is around 18 to 22%, right? But what if it continually grows to 30%, it grows to 50%? Like I believe there's a study, it says that by 2040 or 2050, America's debt payments, the interest payments to their revenues is going to be around 40%, which is going to be very shocking. Uh. So at that point, you have to ask yourself, are they able to cut down on their spending? Are they able to tell the Americans, no, we're going to cut down on social security, we're going to cut down on defense spending, or we're going to cut down on debt so that we can get our debt into order? And this is why at the base case, we all should be investing, ma. Because I believe that currencies, the dollars in our, uh, in our wallet, right, they are no longer stores of value only already. They are simply medium of exchange. They are colorful coupons that you need to continually stack so that you can exchange for tangible things. And it can be a share in a company. It can be a real estate home, right? It can be a vintage watch or it can be a piece of physical gold. So the trust of money is coming down right now. And the war is just making it bad, lah, even worse. Yeah, I just want to ask, right, like uh, there's this question about the collapse of the US dollar. Right. It's the reserve currency, right? Uh, yeah. Not very really sure whether have you like read or seen this book by Ray Dalio, okay. Changing World Order. So yeah. uh, I think he actually went back like a few hundred years. Uh, I don't know how many hundred. Uh, then he he always look at the how the world order changes, right? So before that, there was like the Dutch and then don't know like a French or whatnot. And then after that, uh, that's the U, uh, UK. Uh. Right. Then after that, then it's the US after the World War II. So right. I think he was saying like uh, there's always some kind of a revolution or some kind of a world war. Then the 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 axis will pivot over uh, from the previous uh, world superpower to the next one. Right. So do, do you see like uh, there there is like a possibility of an imminent like war before the US uh, will lose their supremacy as, as the reserve currency? Well, when it comes to wars or that, right, I'm not an expert at it, right? Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the economic moves by America, right, you can see that they're exerting their influence already. They're exerting their influence to the world. 
And before I touch on that, maybe I touch on the real values of China becoming the next one, right? Yeah. I, I believe that we are moving towards a bipolar world in a sense. Lah. Like I do not believe that it is feasible for China at this point of time to completely overtake America, right? It's because they have a lot of domestic problems as well. America has also a lot of domestic problems. But what we can see right now, right, is two centers of power are really moving front in the world, right? One of it is the obvious, right? You know, you're talking about the G7, you're talking about America, Europe, UK, Japan. All these people, they have extreme interest in keeping the US dollar afloat, you know, because they have a lot of debt there. It's technically their allies' currency and uh, big brother America leads the pack, right? So on the other side, right, you can call them, I mean, the rebel alliance, right? The resistance. The, the, the resistance, the global <laughs> south. The, the axis east, of right? evil. Yeah, a, a lot of people, they have a lot of uh, terms for it, right? But it's more about countries that do not believe that the US dollar should be number one forever. And they are making their own moves to try to uh, knock it down from its pedestal, right? Doesn't mean the dollar will suddenly crash. But if you look at the how do I say the world reserve currency, the share market share, right? You can see the dollars around 58 to 60% right now of all global reserves. And China, let's say the yuan is only at 3 to 5%, right? Let, let's just give it generous 5%, right? Mm. You can see the extreme gap of it, right? So does that mean that if China's share goes up to 10%, America drops down to 45%, can that also be considered a win, right? And just because of that itself, right? It, once again, affects the flow of money, lah, right? So less money will be held in US dollars, which will then affect the bond market, which will then affect um, the stock market as well. Mm. So, so you don't see an a imminent war coming okay. soon? I hope there's no imminent war coming soon because that one is very, very disruptive, very, very inflationary. But chances are we are moving towards at least an economic conflict la, mm. between China la. because you can see right now China they just uh, published a position paper about uh, why they believe that the US shouldn't be the big brother of the world how they are not really living up to the responsibilities of the reserve currency la. so you can see a lot of moves uh, by the US by China all leading to one conclusion that I hope won't happen la. but this is where we need to uh, as I said la, maybe hedge ourselves against the possibility. That's why I'm investing in both China and America at the same time. Yeah, but, but here, here's the very uh, ironic thing, right? You know, the ETF that I buy, right? MCHI, mm. right? Is transacted in US dollars, uh, the China. So, so that's the <laughs> irony of everything. Uh. Yeah, we, we, we are also hedging our position, right? We are friends with US. We are friends with China. We are yep. friends with everybody, actually. So Correct. Singapore is like hedging all sides. Everybody is our friend. Yeah, because you, you really don't know who will win. That's the thing. You really don't know. Actually, if we want to hash and we don't know who will win, right? We just hash in CPF. Ah. Wow. <laughs> what if Singapore don't win? <laughs> CPF, CPF. Uh, CPF is good. CPF is good. But uh, it, it has a lot of case-by-case -case situation, right? You know the CPF, right? You, you cannot take it out until you're a certain age. And the interest rates right now is... um. It, it is quite low compared to what you can get outside, right? You know, if I'm not wrong, it's still at 2.5% or something like that. But then uh, outside, right, you can get easily 3 to 5%. Uh. So CPF is, I, I, I would say you just contribute to it as per the government says, leave it as a very nice nest egg. At the end of the day, you know, you can use it for your housing. You can get a nice payout. But depending on your age, right, if you're younger by a bit, right, it does make sense to go out there and chung, right? So for example, let's say all your money, for example, is tied up in CPF. There's two big risks I see here, right? So the first big risk is let's say one day you decide to do your own business, for example, then you need some capital in order to invest. And if your business works out, it will beat any stock market return in the world, right? Your business can give you 100%, 1,000%, 10,000% return. Up. And on the other hand, let's say suddenly, another Lehman Brothers moment comes. Then the stock market crashes 40%. And you already know that over the next 10 to 20 years, right, the stock market is going to go up. I think it's going to be very hard for you to withdraw money from your CPF by writing in. I think it's going to be quite tough. Okay, just, just in case someone thinks I'm, 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 I'm being serious, that's just a joke. Right? <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't suggest 
topping out everything to CPF. La. It's just a, it, it can be a small part, like 5 to 10% uh, bond allocation kind of thing. La. But you shouldn't go all in into CPF. La. So that's my thought. <laughs> So thanks once again for Sean for coming onto the podcast channel. I think it's been it's greatly insightful because I think this this part of the discussion is really um not there's not a lot of light being shed on on, on this area of alternative asset classes specifically gold investing and um there's a lot of mainstream views that was expressed by us like Eric and Bunti talking about comparing um, performance and whatnot. But I think from Sean's perspective, there was really a lot of great insights and for people to think about. Rather than just say that, okay, everything I just all in SPY and and, and be, be cocksure that it's going to go up um, in the next, I don't know, 30 years. So yeah, um, hope you guys enjoyed the discussion and we'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.